blue line. There we go. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Emron Mayer from UCLA, and I had the privilege of interviewing him last year for the GI Health Summit, and he has a new book coming out in a couple of weeks. It's called The Gut Immune Connection, How Understanding the Connection Between Food and Immunity Can Help Us Regain Our Health. And he's going to tell us his own personal story of gut healing. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Emron Mayer. It's so good to see you again. Thanks, AJ, uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to uh, talk to you again. Right. I remember the first time I interviewed you from your last book, which is wonderful, by the way, you were having your staff Christmas party and I'll never forget, like, I can yeah. really hear you, so I could see you nice and quiet today. I'm, I'm so excited. You, we were talking right before we came on that there seems to be a lot of interest in gut health now, whereas when you started out, not so much. Yeah, there seems to be an explosion of interest in this field. And, um, you know, first it was the brain gut connection and it was the, the, uh, the gut immune connection. And, you know, more and more people are populating this field. And I have to say, you know, in three decades of doing research in this area, um, there was really no interest, zero interest. And if anything, a lot of skepticism. So this is it's pretty dramatic. I, I'm sure there's multiple reasons that are driving this, but uh, it, it's certainly a unique phenomenon that I've experienced in my career. Well, well that's, but it's great, isn't it? That people are finally paying attention to the gut. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, because, you know, the thing is, is it's funny. And one of the things I learned from all the experts on the GI Health Summit is that people don't pay attention to their gut until something goes wrong. Like, for example, we go to the dentist, most of us twice a year, whether we have a toothache or not, but nobody gets a gut check until there, there's something wrong. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, you know, there, there are people that came to this field all of a sudden, really without um, having a background or research interest and so there's a lot of stuff that, that came into the space that, you know, is not really evidence supported. And um, um, it's, but it's, it's sort of become a free for all, you know, if you make a good story about something, then this will, uh, you know, interest the audience. And um, I find it more important than ever, you know, that a few of us, I could count them on a hand, on, on one hand, um, actually come to this field with uh, the honesty and the scientific rigor um, that I think is, is necessary to make this more than just, you know, free talk about um, all this, this stuff that's been floating around in, in uh, you know, in, in all kinds of media. So I, I, I'm really thankful to you for, you know, for giving me this opportunity to, to talk about this. Well, you know, as somebody who's had a, you know, I always joke, I mean, I'm much better now in my 60s, but I always used to joke, I've had a stomach ache since I was four. I've always been very interested in this subject. And the first book, the gut, the gut brain connection was fabulous. And now you've got the gut immune connection. What's the next book? The gut, what, what are you going to make the connection with next? What other body parts do you have left to make? <laughs> That's, yeah, this has been, I mean, I shouldn't really be thinking about this because I'm still completely immersed in, you know, promoting the book and, um, but, you know, there's, there's a few ideas. So, I mean, I haven't really gotten specifically into um, some very common gut diseases like uh, inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and that's certainly one idea that, you know, the, the, the gut disease connection. So it would actually get into these diseases in much more detail. Yep. I mean, it, it almost seems like everybody I know has either IBS or constipation. There, there, I, I, I don't, it doesn't seem that there's, there's a person out there that has like perfect functioning gut anymore. Yeah, and that may have to do, you know, it's certainly being aggravated by, um, by the pandemic. Um, tremendous amount of um, stress and increased anxiety and depression, all of which are factors that, um, as, as you probably know yourself, um, can lead to an increase in the symptoms or the first um, first time onset of symptoms. And I think that's been partially driving this. Um, but there's also, I mean, this whole thing that happened with, uh, you know, from the gut, you go to the diet, um, but from the gut, you go to the microbes. And once you get into the microbes, you have to talk about the diet because the microbes themselves are not really doing things uh, out of thin air. You know, they, they process food. And so I think that link that has happened now with, with diets, serious um, 
nutritionist, you know, who actually matched the seriousness of the microbiome science. I, I think that has really brought um, a rigor and an interest of mainstream um, gastroenterology and, 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 and science into this area. So I think that's the pandemic and um, the link to food, um, I, I think is, are the two things that have really happened. Well, one thing's different is the amount of processed food that we're eating today compared to like my grandparents. And it, it's just in it, it, the amount of ultra processed food. And from what I understand, that's not so great for our gut. There's no fiber. Yeah, there's no fiber. And um, yeah, I mean, as I'll be talking about, you know, in this sort of brief personal journey, I've sort of experienced this always, you know, my new book, I write about what's happened in the last 75 years. So this um, extreme development of um, the big food companies and industrial agriculture, all of which have sort of gone in a direction to take the healthy stuff out of our food and um, make, you know, the most profit with unhealthy, uh, unhealthy food. And um, yeah, so it's, it's clearly, um, I mean, there's many factors, you know, about food, I always say, it's, it's what you eat, where it comes from, um, and when you eat it are the three criteria. It's, it's not just what you eat. You know, you could eat something that looks like a potato that looks incredibly tasty and healthy, but that potato is different in terms of its fiber amount from potatoes that were sold 70 years ago. You know, with, and now we've ended up with a very small number of, of potato um, species because all the other ones have not been considered to be optimal for processing and putting into french fries you know to a large degree so it's yeah and you know it's interesting because as you know doctors don't get very much nutritional training in medical school and even gi doctors it's, it's not very common for doctors to even ask patients what they're eating or tell them what not to eat yeah this has been uh, and and i'm definitely a victim of that um training and education myself because uh, you know, until I wrote my first book and really got into the microbiome part of the brain gut axis, um, I didn't have much interest in diet. I mean, it's not something, you know, I mean, I like to uh, eat a, a good meal, but it's not something that I would make a science out of. And um, that's because, so I had no training whatsoever, you know, not an hour in, in my, uh, so in, you know, in Germany was six years of medical school, not a single hour about uh, nutrition and diet other than you know, protein and carbs and, 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 and lipids, the macronutrients, but that's not what the answer is. You know, the answer is, as, as we'll talk about later, you know, is, is some other part of, of, of the food that we eat. And um, I mean, this is gradually changing. There, there are now, um, you know, there's a lot of young physicians. I can see it with our students that come, the, the pre-med students that have an interest. I see it on some of my young colleagues who actually, you know, have a master's degree in nutrition. So this is not changing. I, I think we're on the verge of really um, medicine and gastroenterology, just at the same time when, you know, all the mindfulness components have now entered the mainstream. Um, so the mind targeted therapies. So a lot of young physicians are interested in, in incorporating, in training in these techniques and incorporating this. So we are gradually, I think, moving into a more holistic form of the of the you know the mainstream medicine that's these topics have always been covered by functional medicine doctors um, but i think that's really because you know we in in medicine didn't really take care didn't really pay attention to it i, I think that will and have to will have to change um, and particularly you know i'm always coming back to this i mean it has to be science-based it cannot people cannot come up with um ideas, fancy ideas that sound good or sound bites, but, but in reality, where's the evidence? You know, where's the single randomized controlled study longitudinal that has shown that this makes a difference? So I, I think it, it's an exciting time where um, more and more of my colleagues are entering this, this field. That's fantastic. So I pre-ordered your book on Audible because I prefer to listen to read. And I know I have a few recipes that I contributed to it. I've been posting the link so people can, can pre-order it if they like on Amazon. And I'm, I'm so impressed. You've got a couple of my favorite colleagues that endorsed it, Dr. Joel Furman and Dr. Will B. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, and those are people that I mentioned earlier, you know, of the handful of people that I think are really um, 
playing a prominent role in, in the, uh, you know, in the evidence-based revolution of, of, of this field. And um, yeah, thanks for pre-ordering it. This is a great uh, idea. If I can encourage anybody in the audience to do the same thing, um, I will do this here and hopefully by the end of this conversation, you know, people will be really curious to see it. That would be great. Well, you know, I said that how we don't, we get teeth check and we get, you know, we don't get a gut check. And Colleen is saying, how would one even get a gut check? Like how, somebody that has no symptoms, how would we even assess our gut health? How would we know it's optimal or not? That is still difficult, you know? So for example, gut permeability or leaky gut, this has become a catchword in the field and it plays a central role also in my second book. Um, that's something that we can easily measure in, in, in mice, or you can take a piece of intestine and put it into a, a test chamber and, and characterize the, the permeability. Um, it's much harder to do this in humans. You have to rely on um, the secondary effect of this leaky gut, which is like all of a sudden there's immune molecules popping up in your circulation, even though you have no symptoms. So I, I think paying, there's also attempts, you know, or several methodologies to, um, to look at uh, fecal microbiota and metabolites. I would say that that field is still in, um, in evolution and under construction. I think it's been rapidly moving from being interested to know what microbes are there and what abundances um, and what uh, diversity and richness is there um, to a whole new way of looking at it. What do these microbes um, produce? So this is called the metabolites that the microbes make. And that's really what interacts with our body. It's, it's not the microbes themselves, it's what they produce jointly, not one microbe, but jointly. And this field of, um, you know, has these fancy names, um, metagenomics or metatranscriptomics, um, we're, we're, we're just on the, on the beginning end of that. And m many of the tests that are currently available and being sold for um, people to get a gut check, I would say, I mean, they're neither FDA approved nor have they really been validated, um, uh, you know, in terms of their usefulness. We, we, I think we're close to that point. And some of these techniques that are available um, are better than others, like, um, you know, a company that I have to disclose, I'm on the scientific advisory board with this, um, is Viome, who uses probably the best technique. Um, but I think their recommendations are not really based on the solid evidence that we ultimately need. You know, you need artificial intelligence of hundreds of thousands of, of samples that you can then say, you can say with confidence, this is abnormal and this is a risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease, or this is um, this justifies a specialized individualized diet. I think we'll get there in the next five years, um, but I think a lot of people put their false hopes on many of those, um, uh, you know, tests that that are available now commercially, and, and think that's the answer to everything. That's really not the case yet. Uh, so Lori, who's watching live, you mentioned how the pandemic is affecting people's gut, but she, she wants to know how is the SARS-2 virus affecting it? Is it just because people are very stressed or is there something particular about the virus that, you know what I'm saying? Or is it maybe both? It's probably both. I mean, there's definitely the effect of, of stress and anxiety that, uh, that the brain sends out these signals um, through the autonomic nervous system, the stress system. To the gut, uh, changing its its permeability, its uh, leakiness, the abundance of microbes. Um, but there's also so that the the virus itself does not enter through the gut. You know, the the what the gut part does and the diet part does in in this in this epidemic, it changes the responsiveness of immune cells, and ultimately, you know, one phenomenon that's been seen in in patients with severe um, COVID-19 or the long COVID is that there's an excessive immune activation, it's something that's called a cytokine storm, um, where these immune molecules are produced in, in, a, in an excessive amount and the body cannot downregulate this appropriately. So they have, they have more symptoms. And um, that's something that's influenced by the interactions of our gut microbiome with the gut-based immune system. So we, uh, just imagine our immune system 
70% is located in the gut. A lot of them circulate through the gut on their, in their life cycle. Um, and so if the diet and the microbes can affect the responsiveness of these immune cells in the gut, that has an effect on what happens in the lung and what happens in the, in the, in the brain. So it's not, a, it's not that these viruses get in through a leaky gut, it's how the leaky gut and the immune system overactivation affects the response of the lung and the over, and, and, and other organs in the in the body. But there's clearly a connection between, you know, between um, between the virus. Uh, people that are infected are more vulnerable. So many people that were are more vulnerable um, have what's called these comorbid conditions. So these are these chronic non-infectious diseases from type two diabetes to, um, um, you know, obesity, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, and those diseases, you know, as I really lay out in my, in my, in my new book, um, can all be traced back to this uh, unhealthy gut and uh, the inappropriate activation of the immune system in this unhealthy gut, and then with these widespread effects. So clearly, greater risk for developing COVID, greater risk for developing complications, both acute and chronic, um, and effect being mediated mainly through the immune system um, in, the, in the gut. So we'll learn a lot more about you know, COVID-19. We're really, uh, there have already been hundreds, maybe thousands of research studies, but we don't know all the pieces yet, but I, I'm, I'm sure this will come out as, a, as an important factor, the vulnerability to this disease is, is definitely related. It's interesting. I'm sure at some point we'll, we'll understand this. Would you like to share your screen? Because I know you've prepared a lovely presentation for us about your own personal gut journey. Yeah, and I should say this is something very unusual. I've not done that before, but um, you know, since we have known each other for a long time and have talked before, I thought this would be a good thing to, uh, you know, to, to share with the audience. So let me... Um, Okay, so my, my personal journey to optimal gut health. So this goes way back. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I mentioned some of these things in my, in my podcasts, in my articles, but this is sort of the first time I'm really disclosing that. Okay, so let's start with the problem. We, we talked a little bit about this. Um, so this is kind of the, the distribution of our health and chronic disease in the, in the US population, going from optimal health to chronic disease. And you already can see there's sort of a <clears throat> disproportionate size of chronic disease that's taken up here. <clears throat> but not only that, but there are these stages of suboptimal health and pre-disease. So as you talked about earlier, this when it starts in the gut, it starts really here. Um, and here before it becomes a chronic disease like, uh, you know, type two diabetes or um, cardiovascular disease or any of the ones that, that our healthcare system, so I like to call it our disease care system, um, you know, is, is specialized of dealing with. There's a certain time when this over here, which has no symptoms, um, crosses a threshold or is a clinical diagnostic threshold of disease. And so this is a real problem. So less than 5% of the population in the US uh, can say they are in optimal health. There's criteria from the World Health Organizations, but the majority you can see is really falls into this large spectrum from suboptimal disease to, to chronic disease. Wellness um, is particularly a uh, manifestation of optimal health. Some people over here can still feel, have that sensation, but um, it's, it's really something that everybody is now striving for to increase their own wellness um, and their gut health. So one example, as I mentioned, mentioned a couple of times, what happens is so the long-term um, consequences when we cross the threshold from this um, sub, subclinical disease state. So what we've seen since uh, you know the, the 60s, we started in the late 50s, this um, dramatic rise in uh, obese men, also obese women, 
Um, and I'm just showing this for, for obesity, very similar graphs you can show for uh, cardiovascular disease, for uh, colon cancer in younger people, um, certainly for all the autoimmune diseases. So pretty much all what's been called a chronic um, non-infectious disease epidemic. And this is the real problem. It's, it's not that it's cosmetically unattractive to be obese. It's really what this represents, tip of the iceberg. And I'm just illustrating here. So our gut health is in some ways related to a greater risk for all of these diseases that have all been increasing in the last 75 years. And not only have they all been increasing, they all pose increased risk for each other. So um, if you have Parkinson's disease, you're more likely to suffer from depression. Same is true for Alzheimer's disease, the metabolic syndrome, all of these are more common. Um, same with cardiovascular disease. And so colon cancer is one of a recent one that has received attention because it's been popping up in, in younger and younger um, uh, patients. So this is a good example. This epidemic has affected young kids. I could have shown you a graph for obesity rates in, in children, which is equally uh, dramatic. Um, and whenever you see that, you see also an increase in diseases that are related um, to the obesity and, and the metabolic disturbance. So how did we get there? And this, I think, is the only um, slide I'm sort of summarizing this. So dramatic changes over the past 75 years in lifestyle, let's say particularly diet, uh, chronic stress, which I didn't list here, is um, regular excess, physical exercise. Um, changes in the initial establishment of our gut microbiome, so the early colonization, both in hospitals, altered exposure to microbes. Um, we've cut ourselves off from this natural exposure to microbes in our environment. Um, and then, you know, related to this, the inappropriate use of antibiotic in excessive amounts um, and this gradual increase in hygiene, even during the pandemic, obviously it was essential, the hygiene. The question is, did that make the microbiome problem even worse during that year where everybody now is, uh, you know, is paranoid about uh, uh, touching anything? So this all have contributed to the state of dysbiosis, meaning a altered composition and function of the gut microbiome, the gut microbiota. Um, and this altered gut microbiome has interacted with our, with our gut, the cells lining the gut and the immune cells just underneath the surface. Um, this system has rapidly changed with these influences. This system is fairly uh, conservative and uh, stagnant. Uh, it's regulated by a mere 20,000 genes. So a mismatch has developed between our greatly altered gut microbiota and a uh, not so dramatically altered or adapted uh, immune system. And that's uh, related, that, that's led to immune system activation, ultimately affecting all the organs throughout the body. So these neurodegenerative diseases in the brain, fatty liver, um, pulmonary diseases that we talked about earlier with risk increased risk for COVID-19 and also the GI tract with inflammatory bowel disease and colon cancer. This is in a, in a close-up um, cross-section through our gut, the gut lining again, the immune cells just underneath it, some immune cells extending into this mucus layer, which is our, a, a barrier that separates our microbes from the gut and also from these immune sensors. So what's happened in the last 75 years with the dysbiosis in response to standard, standard American diet and chronic stress is that this mucus layer has thinned um, to the point that now microbes come in contact with these immune cells that stick into the gut lumen uh, and have led to an activation of the gut-based immune system which in turn can loosen the junctions between these gut cells, the lining, which then allows microbes actually to enter the systemic circulation, this translocation of microbes. And that's resulted in this state called metabolic endotoxemia. So this is something, endotoxemia is something when you have a severe infection, a life-threatening infection, um, and you develop an endotoxemia. This happens without the infection. This happens simply because of a change in your lifestyle. 
diet and chronic stress, both of which actually have a similar effect on this system. And then if you have an increased genetic risk for any of these diseases, um, you will develop some of these. So if you just have this, you have no disease risk, you may get away with living to, into your 80s without ever coming down with a severe disease, but that's unlikely. It's much more likely that you develop F genes that increase your risk for metabolic syndrome, Parkinson's disease, colon cancer, and so forth. So this is in a nutshell, the layout for, um, I, I think what puts us at this increased risk um, with our current uh, lifestyle. So there's, there's factors that have contributed to this, um, changes in our environment, soil, water, air, um, diet. There's also the stressors, the psychosocial stress and the dietary stress, both of which have a similar effect on the gut, on gut health and on the gut microbial health. Um, but then it's important to mention there's resilience factors. So a healthy diet from early life on, clearly on top, regular physical exercise, healthy mind states, um, and beneficial environmental micro microbes, the exposure to a lot of microbes in our environment from, from animals, from the soil, from, you know, even from other people, and social support system. So what has happened, these factors have deteriorated and these factors have, um, in some have protected some people from coming down with um, you know, serious illnesses. So let me throw in my, my personal journey. So I would have to say in the beginning, I've been fortunate to actually have many of these resilience um, factors in, in my upbringing. So I grew up in a small town in Southern Germany um, in the Alps uh, called Traunstein, an old painting. Um, I had the handicap of growing up um, with a family tradition of making and enjoying sugary foods. I think you have something in your history as well, uh, similar. I had no clue at the time that there was anything bad to it. Sugary foods was associated with the seasons and with, uh, with all the holidays, Christmas, Easter, uh, you know, um, everything was, uh, weddings was celebrated with, with sugary foods. And the reason that happened because I, you know, grew up in a family, several generations of confectioners, chocolate makers, um, and, uh, go, you know, going back to the uh, mid 19th uh, century. And, you know, I'm pointing out here, so this was a pretty serious business at the time. This was not making um, low quality, high sugary foods. So my grandfather pointed out here, that here is this um, and here. These are pretty serious. This looks like an, a, a university setting with university professors. So this was the place where he learned how to make these chocolates and the, um, you know, these, these, all, all these tasty sweet stuffs. Um, he, he went to that school. He went to a special training in Nice in France. Um, and then, you know, this shows him. So being proud of making these, these um, buildings and statues out of sugar that were then exhibited in the, in the, in the, in the store. So sugar was ubiquitous and, um, you know, it, it, in retrospect, I have to say it ruined my teeth, but interestingly, it did not ruin my health. And one of the reasons for that, so I, again, this started earliest with, with, with the first years in life, with one year of working in the, uh, you know, in the, in the place where all these things were made um, in my parents' store. And um, obviously as a kid, you don't refrain from constantly tasting and, and, and eating, you know, the dough and the sugar and the chocolate that you work with. So if it had been just for that, I think I, sh I should have developed, um, you know, childhood obesity and, um, you know, type two diabetes and probably would be at a high risk of, of colon cancer by now, but something else happened, um, which I mentioned under the resilience factors. So I spent my summers on the farm of, um, of my uncle. And uh, this gives us just some idea of how different that farm experience was from when you see pictures today of uh, large scale industrial uh, growing of corn and soybeans in the, in the Midwest. 
So this was all um, was associated with a lot of you know hard physical labor. To uh, there, were, there were no machines at the time. Um, for some reason, I always felt really attracted to farm animals, and um, and you'll see a few pictures like that. Um, so not only cows but also pigs um, and 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 horses. So I spent, I would say, eight weeks each year immersed in um, microbial exposures from, from not just the farm animals, but also the soil and from the manure that we, you know, moved by hand out of the uh, um, stables onto this machine, which then was, was used to fertilize the soil. So there was no chemical fertilizer. Uh, it was all directly from, from the animals. And a good example is that when we worked in the fields, um, the, the lunch break always included the potatoes that we had just picked like an hour earlier from, from this healthy soil that had been you know, nurtured with, um, with, 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 with natural fertilizer. So the other thing I, I mentioned earlier, so we know that um, regular physical exercise plays an important role, not just in our health, but also um, in the uh, health of our um, of our gut and our gut microbiome. There's many studies now that have shown this. Uh, so a few examples from about the time when I spent my summers uh, on the farm, we also um, went into the mountains um, as much as possible. It was generally not a week where we were not hiking for hours in the mountains. And I sort of maintained that, that um, habit um, you know, for a long time uh, until my current uh, uh, situation. So I think the combination of <clears throat> nurturing the microbes being in a natural environment, and I should admit, I've, I've never really measured my microbial diversity. <clears throat> I would assume it's, it's actually pretty diverse and rich. I did not get excessive antibiotics as I certainly nurtured it with natural microbes all the time. Um, fermented food products were ubiquitous in the cuisine at the time from yogurt to kefir to sour milk. And um, so these, um, you know, these things were always there, but they were for me not, I was not conscious. I was not doing this because I wanted to improve my health. Neither did my parents. You know, this was just the lifestyle at the time um, that a lot of people in this part of Europe uh, we're, we're living and probably also the same in the United States. I, I think it will be very similar. I took a picture here. So this has um, this has led ultimately fairly late in my life um, to um, this focus on gut health, healthy lifestyle, healthy food, and ultimately healthy planet um, that I now uh, you know enthusiastically uh, teach and embrace. Started out with the mind gut connection in 2016, where it showed that uh, you know optimal health, um, the, the difference between the North American diet, Mediterranean diet, and uh, the, the effects on, on optimal health, but also on these effects of emotional factors such as um, anger um, and anxiety, um, any kind of emotions that, that have an effect on the gut microbiome and gut health. And then this whole topic of early memories, um, thank God I, I can only recount positive memories, but many people um, you know, have been exposed to early adverse life events. Again, we know today our major risk factor um, for poor gut health um, and um, an alteration in, in gut microbial programming. So from, from a diet that was probably from a macronutrient standpoint, not the healthiest. Um, certainly lo lots of red meat, um, lots of animal-based fats um, that, that I grew up on. Um, but obviously without ultra processing, everything was natural. The, the most uh, strict farm to table type of um, food that we had um, to something that I today um, you know, promote as a solution as, as one of the best solutions to our current uh, health epidemic. And this is, um, at the centerpiece is a largely plant-based diet, as shown here in this pyramid. Um, not exclusively, um, if somebody is for ethical or religious reason, um, a, a vegan, that's obviously 
totally fine. And I fully understand that. But if you just look at it from a pure health standpoint, um, this is as good as it gets. Most of the studies that we have um, that are associations, um, cross-sectional uh, population-based studies, it would seem that there's a great advantage of being on this diet compared to the standard American diet. Um, and um, it's obviously easier to um, sustain and, and promote than if you, if you eliminate um, you know, any, any type of meat completely or, or animal products. And there's a good reason for this. This is low in refined carbohydrate, high in omega-3 fatty acids, importantly high in diverse fiber and emphasis being on diverse. You see the diversity of products here. Um, diverse in polyphenols, or it's been referred to as antioxidants. Um, and as pointed out by many prom, uh, people that promoted the, Medi the traditional Mediterranean diet, um, something that has a big component for mind-body interactions, social interactions um, in, in any form, which was very common in these, in these or still is in these Mediterranean countries. And this Mediterranean diet is translated by our microbes into um, hundreds of thousands of metabolites of breakdown products, which then get into our bodies, um, into the immune system in the gut, but also throughout the body, reaching the brain, the liver, the lungs, uh, all the organs, and exerting together as a sort of really remarkable combinatorial system, these health benefits on, um, you know, that, that, that we're talking about. So my, my last slide here, so this is clearly something um, is exciting that we have seen a um, beginning transformation on multiple levels from um, uh, companies that produce food. There's a small number that have jumped on this, um, on, on, on this train, on this health train um, to scientists, um, to some politicians, still have a long way to go. We certainly have to get to healthy diets, um, which come from sustainable uh, food systems in order to assure our own health, which is closely linked to the environment, mental health and the health of the planet. Uh, slides, you mentioned this in the beginning. So if anybody wants to know more, go to my website, mrmayor.com uh, and subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, um, which you can do on, uh, on the website. So this is all I wanted to share with you and that was fantastic thank you and you have a podcast too don't you dr meyer because i've heard you interview dr Furman several times yeah so the mind gut conversation is our podcast so we invite people um not just in the field of nutrition uh, but also uh, since i strongly believe it's the mind gut uh, microbiome system that's important for our health uh, so people that talk about um uh, you know, mind-based therapies, um, stress, uh, stress management techniques to gut health and to gut microbial health. So it's a, it's a wide range of, of expertise that we draw on in, in these podcasts. Yeah, I, I enjoy it very much. So would you like to answer a couple of questions that I'm seeing in the, in the chat and that somebody actually wrote in in advance when they heard you were going sure, to? Sure, sure. All right, great, thanks. So this is from Donna and she said, I really enjoyed the GI Health Summit. I'm a fellow SIBO sufferer and currently on a low FODMAP, whole food plant-based diet. I have a doctor and nutritionist, but I'm just wondering if you could give some words of wisdom or encouragement as I want to return to an unrestricted whole food plant-based diet where I can eat regular quantities of staples like cauliflowers, cashews, dates, etc. I've been on low FODMAP since the end of February and struggling with the FODMAP reintroduction phase. It took forever even to be able to start this phase and really need to see a light at the end of the tunnel. I don't know how you go back to or how long it took you to go back to eating unrestricted diet, but any words of encouragement would help. I don't know if I'm the one to encourage her because there are certain things I was never able to go back to eating and I just had to accept that. Do you yeah, so I have to disclose, you know, I'm not, um, I'm personally not a fan of the low FODMAP diet. I, I do not recommend it, uh, even though it does help, you know, a lot of people with their bloating and um, <clears throat> The big question is always, this is not a diet you want to stay on in terms of your microbiome health uh, is actually 
some of the worst diets that you can have because you deprive your microbes from these complex carbohydrates um, that they thrive on. Um, the, the one thing that's, that's easy to answer is, you know, the, the milk products, um, which are not really meant for the adult GI tract because, you know, very few adults have the enzyme uh, um, lactase to break down lactose. So, you know, milk is for babies primarily, but later we should really avoid it unless it's in terms of, in, in, in the form of fermented products. But overall, um, what the, the, you know, what the colloid really runs into is the big problem. It's not a diet you want to stay on. It's not good for your overall health on a long-term basis. Um, I do it the other way around. I start people on a largely plant-based diet, um, ask them to keep a diary. If any in that healthy diet is causing reproducibly symptoms, um, then I would recommend to uh, take that out for two weeks watch the symptoms and do this actually twice. If there's clearly an improvement of the symptoms and then they come back with the reintroduction, then that component is probably not good for you. Uh, and, and you should either cut down the amount or actually avoid it altogether. So it's, it's the other way around. You know, I don't start with the exclusion and then trying to get back to regular. I start recommending what's generally the healthiest diet for our microbes. Um, and then, you know, adjust it. I should also say, you know, I said earlier, so I, I recommend to pay attention to where comes your food, where, where your food comes from and where it's grown um, um, and when you eat it. Uh, the other uh, advice is um, you should always eat the, the kind of things that we know are optimal for our gut microbial health. If you do that, you get everything else automatically. So if you focus on feeding your microbes enough diverse fiber and enough um, variety of polyphenols, uh, you'll do the best thing for your, for your health, gut health and systemic health. And you're not the first uh, gastroenterologist that doesn't recommend the low FODMAP. I hear it can, long-term can cause nutritional deficiencies. It's just very difficult. Like as a chef, I can tell you, like in my world, everything starts with an onion and you take an onion away from me and I don't know what to make you, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, well, there are some phenomena that we've seen in the diet world and often started with uh, best-selling books, you know, the, um, the gluten-free diet is another topic. So I'm not a fan of that other than for patients with documented celiac disease. Um, and yeah, so, but it's too late for that. The train is out of the station for, you know, most people now believe that that's the first step they need to do to go on the low FODMAP in a gluten-free diet. They fool themselves, you know? I mean, you have to focus on what you can do to optimize gut microbial health, not what you, Need to take out. I, I think it's it, it's almost a hundred eighty degree different philosophy that I you know promote. What I love about you and the whole team of UCLA, and we interviewed so many of your wonderful staff, is that you're one of the only. I want to say the, at least one of the only ones I know, I know that like Dr. Drossman is like that too, that believes in the whole person approach because you can be eating the most perfect diet in the world, but if you're always stressed and angry, it's, it's not going to set right. And you really teach that other component, the mindfulness component in your clinic, which I think for a lot of people until they incorporate that, it almost doesn't matter what they eat. Yeah. And, and that goes back to, you know, um, I said earlier, it's, you have to look at this, this, brain or mind gut microbiome as a system, you know, that's connected with multiple um, uh, feedback loops. You cannot, if you just want to address one part of the system, the others will readapt. And, and at the end, nothing will change overall. So you have to address all of them at the same time. And in most people, you know, that have come through my clinic or that I've seen as, as, as patients, that worked the best. You know, I would say that I can't help everybody, but some 70 to 80% of, of patients feel that that approach um, is something that they have not done in, in the past. They've always focused on one little thing. Um, you know, like the SIBO people will focus on this antibiotic that they swear on, even if they get it eight times and the symptoms are still not gone. Um, so those are extreme examples, but I would say if you don't look at the whole human being and this whole brain gut microbiome system, you will not really reach the state of optimal health 
if you remember on that curve, the small, you know, less than 5% of our population that are in that state. I really appreciate the work you do at UCLA and all the people were just amazing that you, you sent to me for the summit. Um, so uh, Stephanie is asking about keto. A lot of doctors promote it, but even if it was good, which I don't believe it is, not for human health, animal health, or planetary health, I can't imagine just eating a bunch of fat and meat is optimal for our, our microbiome. Uh, where's the fiber? Again, same comment I made earlier, you know, with the low FODMAP diet. It's unfortunate that all these, these diet recommendations, these schools of thought, they came about before microbiome science really unfolded, you know, and so they, they're all based on the wrong assumptions. Um, yeah, the keto diet, I mean, there's a few exceptions, you know, like uh, intractable uh, seizure disorder in young children, uh, the keto diet does help. Um, there's some evidence, not strong evidence, but some evidence that in advanced patients with Alzheimer's disease, it may um, alleviate some of the symptoms of advanced stage, even though early stage Alzheimer's, we recommend the Mediterranean diet. And as you say, it's, it's bad for, for multiple players. It's bad for the microbes. It's bad for our gut. Um, and it's really bad for the environment. You know, the, one of the worst things that is happening with this, um, you know, this industrial style meat production that we have and the um, monocultures of, of soy and, and corn to feed all these cows, which is, you know, reason for cutting down the rainforest in the Amazon and in other parts of the world. Um, it all has negative side effects. You know, you, I mean, you can, I, I think what you can do is, um, and certainly we do this ourselves, you know, uh, by eliminating um, sugar stuff that I've grown up on and, um, and other refined carbohydrates and substituting it. There's a lot of oils and fats and protein in plants, you know, which does not have these, any of these negative effects that we mentioned just for the, for, for the animal, you know, derived products. And that's something that certainly helps with weight control. You know, it's certainly, um, if you eat, you know, lots of nuts and, um, which by themselves are high caloric, but if you don't add the sugar to it, which unfortunately our highly processed snack, um, um, processed snacks are always combined with sugar, then uh, it's it's actually a healthy food, you know, and and it has, does not have these negative uh, impacts on, on 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 the environment. So I would say, and again, it's it's sort of really based on this basic concept. If you do what's best for the microbes, which is plant-based, then all these other things will happen automatically. You know, you will, you will eat more as are parts of the traditional Mediterranean diet. You will eat more um, seeds and nuts and, um, um, you know, components that have fat and protein in it, but you don't really have to start with that. It comes automatically, you know, when, when you, and it's, it's something that I always find interesting when you, when you think about it, like all these concepts that we and a few others are proposing now, we, we have known this for some time. I mean, there's good epidemiological studies that have shown that a lifestyle with a healthy diet, regular physical exercise and calm mind states um, prolongs disease-free interval at the end of life by 10 years. What we, what we haven't known until now is what are the mechanisms? And I think, um, so we could just stop now and say, let's just focus totally on educating people about these three pillars of a healthy life um, and longevity. Um, but, you know, the science is equally exciting and people want to know why this works and often only do things if, it's, if there's a scientific basis to it. But I, I think we've known these things for a long time. It's, it's just now, they're becoming into mainstream science. You know, on my earlier show today, I had a lovely chef and people were saying how beautiful her skin was. And she said, it didn't used to be that way. It wasn't until I healed my gut. I wonder what other conditions can be healed once a person heals their gut. Because she said until she got her gut in check, her skin never looked good. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, you know, this, um, this system in our gut, um, this interface between 
between the microbes, the gut wall, and the gut-based immune system, and the gut-based hormonal system, um, and the gut-based nervous system, that that system does not. So what happens there does not stay in the gut. You know, it's um, it spreads throughout the body, both in terms of the hormones, the inflammatory molecules, um, and so it's not surprising, you know, that that any organ, including the skin, are positively affected by treating that interface in a way um, that keeps it in its healthy, natural state. Um, yeah, so it's not it's not surprising. We just haven't paid that much attention to it. You know, there's a few diseases. There's a few diseases where we know there's skin complications like ulcerative colitis, um, I think also celiac disease. There's a few where this is is obvious um, or has been known for a long time. But the fact that this is part of um, even if you don't have a major disease, that the gut plays a big role in in your skin health is is something that's you know that's pretty obvious. That's great. Let's see. Oh, you know, it's funny. You know, uh, uh, pregnant women always say they're eating for two, but in a way we're eating for like trillions, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. So that, um, and that's sort of why, why, why I said we're not doing this with the standard American diet. You know, we have um, industrial agriculture and industrial food production <coughs> have created a diet that's constantly starving all these microbes. You know, they, they're, they're feeding selfishly, we're just feeding ourselves because everything is being absorbed in the small intestine <clears throat> before it even gets down there. So the microbes are kind of shut out of this, uh, out, out, out of this feeding system. It's, it's only when you change your diet in a way that more and more food components are actually reaching the gut microbes in the end of the small bowel and the large intestine, uh, then you're actually feeding them. But um, so most people, when they say this, we're feeding you know trillions of microbes. Well, they're actually not doing this in a in a responsible way because they're starving that 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 system, and that's a big reason why we deal with the diseases that we're dealing with. Great, thank you. I see a question here from April. Could you please address food sensitivities causing headaches? I have no gut issue, but I know from doing an elimination diet, the headaches are from food. So there's still between sensitivities and intolerances and allergies, aren't they? There are, there are three different mechanisms. Yeah, there are three different mechanisms. The most we know about allergies, you know, that, that clearly with this modern lifestyle, um, eliminating our contact with you know, the microbes from the environment um, that, that teaches our, our immune system early on in life what's good and bad. Um, since we have eliminated this to a large degree, so many people grew up in big cities in sterile apartments without ever having been exposed to, to the, like if you grew up in New York City, then um, the immune system is brought up in a way that it makes a lot of misjudgments. So all of a sudden it attacks things, both in your own body, the autoimmune diseases, but also in terms of allergies, uh, food components that normally would not have triggered this reaction. If you had a really smart, uh, well-trained immune system. So that starts early in life, probably the first three years of life, that um, there's sort of the, the basic foundation of these, of these food allergies, which have been increasing. So peanut allergy, did not exist when I went to medical school and many other allergies. Um, so food sensitivities is a more difficult issue. Um, that, um, I mean, I've, as I wrote in my first book, the gut is our biggest sensory organ in the body. And um, it's very specialized sensors that pick up food components. And, um, and many of these, these receptors on these nerve cells could be the vagus nerve, could be the enteric nervous system, could be the sympathetic nerves. If they are slightly altered, they will produce um, negative reactions to, you know, normal food components. Um, they may also be worsened by um, the chemicals that are, that are part of our modern food supply. Um, you know, we this has not been studied in, in great detail, like all the, the pesticide and herbicide residues that are and that's one of the, the downsides of a largely plant-based diet. I mean, if it's 
if it's not coming from organic sources, you are ingesting a lot of chemicals that should not come in contact with your gut or your gut microbes. But what exactly the mechanisms are to produce these food sensitivities, um, it somehow points to the same concept that you know this starts happening in the gut and then because the gut is connected to all the other organs in the body through the immune system and the nervous system, uh, it can manifest in, in the form of headaches. So I would say we, we do know what happens in uh, autoimmune diseases, which have been also increasing last 75 years. Um, it's less well understood with food sensitivities. And you get into an, an area that's sort of a gray zone between, you know, without dismissing the, 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 the seriousness of this. So many people develop food-related phobias, you know, a very important component that when they just think about a food that triggers already the symptoms. And that's not really related to the food coming in contact with the gut. It's something that is programmed in their memory and it triggers the alarm bells whenever they think or see that food item. Some really good studies on that. Uh, by the woman, uh, Elia Crum in, 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 at Stanford, that, who has looked at this. And I think a big part of this food, this increase in number of food sensitivities have a component of that, the, 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 the fears of food or food related anxieties. You know, some of the doctors I interviewed said it's so much the, the glyphosate, the soil, GMOs, so many of these new chemicals that didn't exist before are definitely affecting at least some people's gut. Yeah, and this is something we, we know relatively little considering, you know, how big that, um, that whole GMO industry is. And I always said that it's, it's, it's not the gene modification that's the dangerous thing. I mean, that's a whole other story. It's, you know, modified corn is probably not worse than, than, than regular corn. The problem is the stuff that's being sprayed on them, you know, in increasing amounts and concentrations. And um, that, you know, the FDA let this get away with short-term studies um, on cell cultures that, um, that glyphosate did not have a negative effect because um, human cells don't have this uh, shikamati pathway to break down uh, to, to, you know, to metabolize glyphosate. But in the meantime, we know that many microbes have that pathway and can break it down into substances, chemical substances that are probably just as harmful as the, um, you know, as the parent compound. So what ends up in our gut in increasing amounts because the spraying um, has been increasing dramatically and keeps on increasing because the herbs um, and the pests have developed resistance that ends up in your plant-based food, you know, unless you, you are aware. So this is, a, this is a big challenge, you know, and then the sort of uh, loose labels for organic, where there's all these excep exceptions and loopholes, um, that, that is another problem. So I, I think regulating this industry, um, and there's obviously tremendous resistance, as you can imagine, from, from these big food corporations to to let anything negative come out of this research. And there's, there's few research studies that actually have, 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 have looked into this in greater detail, not, not surprisingly. Oi, that's all I can say. <laughs> it's, it's like you say, you get scared to eat anything anymore. So in addition to being a gastroenterologist, you're also the executive director of the G. Oppenheimer Center for Neurobi Neurobiology of Stress and Resilience. What do those things have to do with digestive health? So stress has a lot to do with it. So when I first got into this field, that was our main interest really, <clears throat> you know, how, how stress mechanisms in the brain um, generate signals that go down to the gut. And we know that, um, yeah, stress affects all organs. You know, we know it's in the cardiovascular system, our blood pressure goes up. And um, the, the difference to the gut is that the gut is such a complicated organ with all these players, the immune system and the, uh, the endocrine system and its own nervous system, that these stress signals um, have a major effect on changing the gut and its function um, and its interactions with food. And so, yeah, that research, we, we pursued this for, you know, for two decades. Sadly, um, even though we thought we were very, very close to 
a medication that would block the successive stress uh, response system. That did not work out. It was, I think, too simplistic a thought that we could actually, with one receptor antagonist, could um, stop that or uh, attenuate it. Um, but, but we still know, you know, many diseases. So we're currently doing a study on inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, um, or individual stress responsiveness. So if you take a hundred individuals, some have a normal responding stress system. Others have an, uh, an excessively responding stress system to the same stressor. And, you know, we just recently showed that the ones with this hyper-responsive stress system Patients with that have a larger number of symptom flares where their symptoms act up um, and they have to see a doctor and get special medication for their gut inflammation. And that seems to be true in, in IBS as well. So there's um, you know, two thirds of patients with irritable bowel syndrome have that increased stress responsiveness. Amongst healthy people, about 10% have that. So, with increasing stress responsiveness, you have a greater um, engagement of that system and almost always with a greater involvement of the GI tract of, of gut symptoms. Could be in bloating, could be in hypersensitivity, could be in uh, altered bowel habits. So very close relationship. The resilience is something, I mentioned this in one of my first slides. So there's always these resilience factors. Everything that we talk about here with you know, stress and bad things for the gut health, there's always resilience factors, you know, which may be you know, growing up in a, in a farm environment or uh, uh, you know, having the healthiest diet from early on in life and not having gotten antibiotics. So there are these resilience factors. Um, and there are resilience factors in the mind as well that some people just process um, the events around them or what they perceive from their body in a different way than those who ring the alarm bells every time that happens. So to answer your question, yeah, stress and resilience very, very closely connected um, to gut health. Do you think a lot of these gut diseases like IBS are on the rise or is it just that there's a lot more awareness now and people are maybe less ashamed to talk about it? I think based on the numbers, uh, there's a greater awareness. I think what has happened that the the criteria to make these diagnoses has been changing every, you know, every I don't know, five or six years. There's this Rome Foundation who comes up with these modified criteria. Every time they change the criteria, the, the prevalence of these diseases changes as well. Um, but if you look at the overall trend, they surprisingly have not increased. Whereas the others, the metabolic related um, and the inflammation related um, have significantly increased. So IBD, the inflammatory cousin of IBS, definitely been increasing and keeps increasing in uh, developing countries. Um, so they're pretty different categories of diseases. I personally think inflammation, immune system activation plays a, a relatively small minor role in IBS, um, but it plays a big role in all these other diseases that we talked about. I almost feel like it needs a makeover as a disease because it's so, it, you know, it, there, there, there's just so many symptoms. And I mean, how can one disease have diarrhea or constipation or both? It almost seems like, you know, it needs a PR firm to give it a, a makeover because it, it's just one of those things that, that I don't know, just. I just yeah, and, uh, and, and, and the PR firms like the Rome Foundation, you know, they've still not been successful as they had hoped it would be to to really clarify it for everybody and make everybody happy, all, all the patients happy, you know, so yeah. it's... Nobody wants, I mean, nobody wants a disease in general, but I just think it needs a better name. I'm, I don't know, which is maybe because I used to be an advertising copywriter. I'll think of one though. I mean, it's <laughs> like when I've talked to doctors that specialize in food addiction, that's a terrible name for a disease. And they've suggested dopamine deficiency disorder, you know, just, just sounds better, IBS. I don't know, nobody knows what that means. So doc, Dr. Mayer, you don't actually see patients, right? But can people come, if they're in uh, Southern California, go to UCLA to see somebody from your team or does anyone do telemedicine? because people like you and your approach. Yeah, so at the moment, you know, there's several people from our center that see patients. Um, um, I stopped seeing patients uh, just before the pandemic started, but am exploring ways of doing telehealth on, because many of the things that um, 
you know, if I have somebody, well, let me put it the other way, 90% of patients that come to see me already have had five colonoscopies and CT scans. And so I don't need to do that anymore. So most of my interaction with patients is educational. And um, I can easily do this on, you know, um, uh, online. And so I'm working on, on that modality too, because I can already see it, you know, with my first book, my practice changed from one where patients were referred by um, other physicians. And when, once the book came out, everybody came with a book in hand with the mind gut connection and pointed out that I'm patient so-and-so in your book. Can you explain this to me better? So um, I would imagine this will happen again with the new book and uh, uh, hopefully I'll be, I'll be ready and set up for providing that advice and that education then. That's great. Well, thank you for all you do to improve the gut health of all of us, other than getting the book, which I'm hoping people will do. Like I said, I ordered, I pre-ordered on, on Audible because I'm a listener more than a reader and listening to your podcast. Is there anything we can do to support you? Do you, are you active on social media or blog, things like that? Yeah. So we're pretty active on, on all social media. So, um, you know, anybody, and, and, and you can get all the details on the website. If you go to the website, um, I, I would say any help in that is um, is greatly appreciated, particularly now in this in this pre-publication phase, in the first couple of weeks of after it comes out. And uh, yeah, if, if you spread the word with your social media contacts, with your friends, family, um, about the, the the pre-order or you know joining the newsletter, would be greatly appreciated. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure talking to you, Dr. Mayer. Same here, AJ. Thanks. Thank you so much. And thanks, all, thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have two shows. Both of them are cooking demos. At 11 a.m., we have Dr. Gustavo Tolosa, who's going to be making something that sounds intriguing. It's called, I don't know what it's called. It's like a rice tower, but it looked beautiful. It's, he's got a really interesting name for it. And he's also going to be playing classical piano because he can do both. And at 2 p.m., we have Chef Martin Oswald, this is a chef that Dr. Furman loves. He's one of the true SOS free chefs that actually owns restaurants. Thanks again, Dr. Mayer. And I wish you every success with this book and I hope everyone will order it. Thanks AJ, bye-bye.